going to teach you about the Spanish-American War. Psych! I am so excited I can't even contain myself. Who is this lecture for? This lecture is for kids lost in school. You might be in middle school, you might be in high school, God knows you might even be in college and you don't know what the hell's going on. So you went to YouTube and you typed in Spanish-American War and I'm yelling at you. Isn't life grand in the 21st century? So whether you're one of those people or you're just crazy on the internet, sit back and relax because Hip Hughes is gonna serve up the Spanish-American War on a plate of learning. Ding dong, dinner is served. Let's go back in time. Um, really what we're talking about when we talk about Spanish-American Wars, we're talking about really the age of imperialism. And we're going to make a distinction because we're not talking about European imperialism. That's a different video. European imperialism is when you take the great flag of France and you go to Haiti and you stick the flag in the land and you say, this is now France. Um, that's like colonialism, imperialism. We're going to do it, but we're going to do it in a very special way. Um, and really we're talking about the period of around uh, late 1800s, like 1890s, early 1900s. Um, specifically in the Spanish-American War, 1898. But nevertheless, let's see if we can't go back even a little bit further and set the stage. So I know that you know the Monroe Doctrine, but I'm going to teach it to you anyway. Dog piss in the hood. Yeah, I said it, dog piss in the hood. I've always kind of taught my kids, not in such a crude fashion, but that if you think of 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe, as dog piss in the hood, you'll get the major concept. Why does a dog take a piss? Well, it definitely does it to relieve itself. I get that. I'm not a dummy. Noam Chomsky knows that, for goodness sake. But the other reason, and I know you're going, I know, I know, pick me, is because it does it to warn other dogs that, you know, this is my hood. So, in a way, America is really thinking Manifest Destiny, not just from coast to coast in the um, early 1800s, but it's thinking about Manifest Destiny from pole to pole. So, therefore, when James Monroe issues the Monroe Doctrine, he's, in a sense, kind of elevating the Washington isolationism to a new realm. See, Washington set isolationism in his farewell address because he very much saw America as needing to be insulated to build itself up. That we were going to stay the hell away from the European war gods because that's what was in our best interest. But now we're interested in the European war gods staying away from us too. So let's go take a leak. And the Monroe Doctrine basically does that in Latin America. Not physically. Don't write that in your essay. How weird would that be? But metaphysically, maybe not even metaphysically, theoretically, the United States is saying to Europe, this is our hood, all right? We might not be able to occupy it right now. We might, be able, we might not be able to control it right now. But this is our land, in a sense. This is our sphere of influence. Sometimes you'll hear that term. Because what would America be like if we had Germany in Mexico? What would America be like if you had, you know, Great Britain colonizing, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nicaragua? This could be really messy in our affairs, in our hemisphere. Look, I'm even sounding American, our hemisphere, like I own the hemisphere. But nevertheless, the Monroe Doctrine is setting the stage for what's going to happen 70 years later, which is really kind of Monroe with a gun, enforcing, we'll call it Roosevelt Corollary later when Teddy Roosevelt's president, but enforcing the Monroe Doctrine with military action. So let's fast forward, let's get through, you know, we're not doing industrialization, you know, we build railroads and factories and we're churning and out products and it's getting into the late 1800s and uh, we're gonna find a reason to invade Cuba so let me go see if I can find that reason there it's right there it's right there I'm gonna go get it all right I'm so excited so here we go guys um, really first you want to understand that there are pro-imperialists in America, people that believe in war, um, uh, with Admiral Mahan or uh, the senator from Massachusetts, which is Breckenridge, uh, William McKinley. There's people that, you know, aren't, I'm not saying that they love war, but they see war as an avenue in order of strengthening the American empire. Um, in a sense, not imperialism in stick a flag and take it over, but in our spheres of influence, having a navy. Mahan writes about this in the influence of sea power um, in the Pacific. Um, later, that'll be the Hawaiian Islands that we're going to take over. Um, that's an ugly story with Queen Lithuania, but nevertheless, um, the open door policy in China, um, Admiral Perry in, in Japan. The United States also had inter 
intervened, I think, like a hundred times um, in the 1800s in Nicaragua and Argentina and all over the world in order of protecting American special interests. That's always been our thesis. That's why we always do things. So now we have the pro-imperialists. Um, we also have anti-imperialists. We have people like, like Mark Twain, who are fundamentally against kind of the concept of taking other people's land, which violates like the Declaration of Independence and consent of the governed and some of the very basic elements that American democracy, American republicanism is founded on. Um, and then I think you have another community that's not talked about a lot of times in your textbooks, and that's the business community. The business community also has a vested interest in an expansionism. Not in, well they do have, they do have a benefit in war because they're going to be buying bullets and tanks and navy ships and steel and all that stuff, but not so much in taking over land, but opening new markets. Um, by the late 1800s, American farmers were overproducing. We had an overproduction of steel and other raw materials and merchandising products. So the business community would love it if we could get our hands into some of these other lands across the world to sell our products to. And Cuba's only, what, 90 miles from the shores of Florida, and Spain is there. And Spain is the problem. Um, Spain is the problem, A, because they're violating the Monroe Doctrine concept. We have Spain in our back door. Um, B, we're going to um, be able, through yellow journalism, to sell this puppy. The newspapers, uh, Randolph William Hearst uh, ran a paper, was very yellow journalistic. Yellow journalism is when you kind of color the truth, you yellow the truth, yellow journalism, in order to, in order to sell things, like sell war. So uh, they would report atrocities and terrible things that the Spanish were doing to the Cubans, um, trying to rile up the Americans to um, save the Cubans. I think the Cuban revolutionaries, by the way, are the pawns in all of this. I don't think anybody other than maybe Mark Twain is interested in helping the Cuban revolutionaries. But we're using that argument that we need to kind of save the Cuban revolutionaries from these Spanish kind of butchers um, of, 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 of Havana. So very much kind of that's the dance that's going on. On. Um, the, the papers are selling the concept of war, the fights going on internally about what to do, um, and then the U.S. Maine explodes. Um, remember the Maine. And we're not going to talk about the controversy about what happened because I wasn't there and I don't know, but um, the story was told back then that it must have been the Spanish. And with the newspapers in the bed with big business who's in bed with the government, you know, really you have a trifecta approach here um, where you can turn public opinion into the Spanish blew up the U.S. Maine, we need vengeance. Um, you also had the DeLone letter, which was a letter that ended up in the newspapers where Spain is saying disparage, uh, bad remarks about William McKinley, and that's pumping up kind of uh, jingoism and nationalism and ethnocentrism and patriotism and all these isms in, in America that are eventually going to lead William McKinley to decide um, that we're going to invade Cuba. So the U.S. Maine is the catalyst um, for us getting into Cuba, and there are many people that think the U.S. Maine was either an accident or, you know, done on purpose, possibly, uh, blown up and um, sank to blame the Spanish. But we can't get into that because I wasn't there and I don't know and I, I'm not a great conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theorist. But nevertheless, now that we're ready to go in, the United States had to do one more thing and had to kind of settle some nerves, so it passed uh, an act in Congress called the uh, the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment basically calmed the nerves of the anti-imperialists by saying, we're not going to annex Cuba. We're not going to Cuba to take over Cuba. We're going to free the Cuban rebels and there will be a, a, a giant orgy of democracy and yada yada yada. Oh god, the BS makes my brain explode. Alright, let's get into Cuba and see if we can't kick some ass and take the Philippines. The Philippines? What the hell are you talking about? Right, so here we go, 1898, uh, the United States is now, um, you know, uh, uh, declaring war, going in to, against Spain into Cuba, and uh, it's called a splendid little war for a reason. I believe there were somewhere between five and 6,000 deaths, um, only 300, 400 through battle. So 4,000, 5,000 of the deaths, more than 90% of the deaths, somewhere around there, are caused by disease. Um, and there, are, you can research this on your own, but there was a story about a meat uh, company that was selling bad meat to the U.S. Army that had been shipped to Liverpool and shipped back to the United States and then shipped to, uh, to Cuba. And uh, the soldiers probably, a lot of them probably died from eating that meat. So 
Six weeks, baby, and that thing is wrapped up. The Rough Riders, Teddy Roosevelt makes a name for himself. Um, it's really not a war, it's an ass whooping. Um, and uh, the Cubans were never on the road map for independence. I, I don't want anybody to think that. Um, as soon as the war is wrapped up, the Cubans aren't even allowed into the peace conference where the Constitution is written. Um, so it very much becomes kind of a neo-imperialistic state, meaning that it's Cuba, it's not America, but it, it's a puppet of America. It's run by America. And the, the, the Platt Amendment, which um, the Cubans had to accept, in order for the United States military to be removed is very much a hand up their rear. Um, it gave us the ability to uh, nix treaties that they made with other countries. It gave us the ability to uh, military intervene when we thought it necessary. It gave us Guantanamo Bay, which we're still dealing with. That's where um, the terrorists are held. And uh, that was taken from the treaty that uh, ended the uh, Spanish-American War. I want to say the Treaty of Paris, but that's a Jeopardy question for you right there. Someone underneath is not going to tell me that I'm wrong or right. Uh, but nevertheless, other things that you have to know, let's grab the Philippines and see if we can't summarize this bad boy. It's over there. Be right back. So we quickly had mentioned Admiral Mahan um, when we were talking about the influence of sea power and uh, he happens to be in the Pacific Ocean and we happen to be near the Philippines during this six week adventure into Cuba and uh, kind of, you know, he grabs the phone and calls up McKinley and what do you want me to do with a Spanish flag in the Philippines? And we took it. We took it. Big steel boats and wooden boats. We took it. Um, and then we're going to stay. Um, you can research on your own, but there's primary resources where William McKinley he talks very white burden man kind of ish about the Philippines, about them being savages and uncivilized, and it's our duty to lift them up, and what are we supposed to do, give them back to the Spanish? Um, so, in, in summary, guys, right, this is a hatch job here. The, the Spanish-American War is a war of new imperialism. It's a war of the Monroe Doctrine. It's a war of raw materials and new markets. It's an economic war to get the United States footprints into Cuba. And Cuba looks like a gangster's paradise after this. Um, you know, uh, corporations and monopolies and, and, and criminals and bootleggers and mobsters and all kinds of kind of whacked out crazy people are going to Cuba to make a buck. Um, it starts to really kind of show that this is a is a war of economics and um, control and not of, of independence or um, freedom or certainly anything um, like a revolution in the, in the spirit of the American Revolution. But we kicked the Spanish out. We've gotten the Philippines, the Treaty of, I'm going with Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris is going to get us uh, Puerto Rico and Guam, some lovely tropical destinations for our uh, for our Americans to go sunbathing. Um, and that's really it. That's the Spanish-American War. Look, there's other imperialistic stuff you're going to need to know. Open door policy and the story of Hawaii and um, Stuart and Alaska. There's really other stories that you need to know. But if you're going to write about something, write about the Spanish-American War. Yellow journalism in the U.S. Maine would be really big. And then really that concept of knowing the Teller Amendment versus the actuality of the Platt Amendment, I think, would make you a gangster rock star on your exams. So we hope you got the multiple choice. We hope that you know a little bit more than when you press the button, and we hope that you press the button many more times to come. Um, start by clicking subscribe, and then go down to the description below, and you'll see that I've copied or pasted um, all the other EDU gurus that are out there, um, and a whole list of other kind of fantastic EDU people, um, and just smart people that are doing great things on the internet that you should be subscribed to and watching them, because there's other stuff out there than fluffy kittens. All right, guys, I'm Hip Hughes, where attention goes, energy flows. Um, I'm out of here. Yeah, like right now.